Hi everybody, Professor Harding here. Today we're going to talk about the words. These are the most important element of a poem. You can't have a poem without them. Um, poems can be written about ideas and about images and scenes and people and all sorts of things, but ultimately they use the word to translate those things. Um, we began the semester with a simple definition of poetry by um, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, which was the best words in the best order. And if you've read our chapter on the words for, um, for this particular sequence, you'll see that there are a number of uh, quotes by famous writers who um, all basically boil it back down to the words. Now, I, I love the words. They, they make me feel sometimes like, uh, like fresh snow falling, you know, where they make me stop and pause and take a look and think about what's going on. And, and sometimes a well-turned phrase just makes me feel something, even if, even if it doesn't necessarily make so much sense. Um, my poems often begin just with a couple of words in, in a good way. And so I want to try in this lecture here to kind of bring you to an understanding of the importance of the words, right? Even if you're not a poet, even if you're not an English major, that um, ultimately choosing your words wisely and carefully is really, really important to effective poem writing. Um, so uh, first of all, I want you to have read the chapter on words that I've posted in the module. And I want you to have out your lecture notes, which basically this lecture is going to follow along with those notes. I'm going to not read them verbatim, but try to kind of lead you through them and explain a little bit further than what the, the notes on the page uh, provide. So I begin the lecture notes with a couple of quotes from your reading that you should look at, including Mallarmé and Ford. Um, the first couple of pages of that reading really do well to emphasize, I think, the the priority of language in poetry. Obviously, you know, um, you can write a poem and supplement it with a photograph or a painting or a picture or something like that, but then what you have is a case in which the image is sometimes doing the work of the words rather than supplementing, and that means your words are not good enough. Um, we have song lyrics that are oftentimes translated into poems, especially by writers like Bob Dylan, Bob Marley, um, but every set of song lyrics is certainly not a poem. They don't necessarily possess the richness or the life um, or the value of um, what we might call a, a legitimate poem. Uh, hard to qualify, obviously, but um, if the words stand alone without the music, they might have a chance. However, most of us can't, um, maybe don't even know the words without the melody that goes behind them and the instruments that kind of hold them up. So if the words can stand on their own, uh, that might be a sign that you've got a poem there. Anyway, words are not all created equal. I have some favorites. Uh, I'll share them with you. Perhaps is a word that I love. Um, it's similar to maybe in meaning, but in meaning only. I always thought that the word perhaps because it takes longer, because it sounds a little bit uh, softer, makes for a more thoughtful representation of the same thing. Maybe, right? But not maybe like a quick one-off. Maybe like, no, I'm really thinking about it, maybe. Um, other words, gut, sordid, evil. Evil is a beautiful word. It sounds like it feels like what it represents. And those are the kinds of words that I think have the most impact on me. Not necessarily your onomatopoeia where you have a word that when you say it, it sounds like it's meaning, but rather a word that feels like it's meaning. Um, what are some of your favorite words? See if you can think of some. See if you can write some down. Um, a well-turned phrase, okay, a set of words, a bunch of words that just kind of seem to go together nicely, uh, often kind of make me happy. Um, but words can't just sound good, they have to mean good as well. And, and what I mean is that ultimately a poem has to make some kind of sense, not necessarily in the scientific, logical sense of the word, but um, uh, 
some kind of sense to a reader, whether that be emotional or what we call dream logic, in which things are not necessarily, you know, the right color or whatever they might be, but nonetheless uh, make a sort of sense to the reader. I've got a little um, line of poetry here with a couple of revisions that begins, Below my window rolls a brook. And that line of poetry might be pretty good. Um, but when we start thinking about the words and starting our editing and revision for that line, if we, need it, if we need to revise it, we see things like this. What if I replace the word rolls, which is a fine word, and it's got the O, which kind of connects with the O in brook, not quite the same, but we replace it with babbles, all right? And then we have below babbles brook, and Brooks babble, and that all makes sense, and that's all well and good. But what if we replace that whole last three-word phrase with the phrase, below my window, water walks by? Now we have something completely different. We have the alliteration, um, water walks. We also have the consonants, window, water, walks, all right? But more so... Think about this, uh, a brook rolling, a brook babbling, those are pretty typical things, but water walking is not so typical, and it almost creates a different sense of the poem that the brook is perhaps strolling by like a neighbor walking down the street, um, and that creates a very different sense of what those lines might have for a value. Anyway, you should have read and understood the, the chapter and the um, lecture on connotation and denotation from the second week of the course. All right, I want to go back over that very briefly. Connotative meaning uh, being a meaning that goes above and beyond what we would call denotation or the definition by a dictionary, the standard common definition of a word. So you take a word like snake, and if you look it up in the dictionary, you might have a meaning that talks about cold-blooded in uh, cold-blooded vertebrate reptile reptile etc uh, and that's all well and good but when we think of a more personal a more figurative meaning for the word snake we start to take it in different directions some people love snakes some people hate them some people are afraid of them some people embrace them some people go biblical other people don't know what to make of it um, and so we have all these different values for words that go beyond the initial or the surface value. Uh, you take a poem like uh, The Mother by Gwendolyn Brooks, and she's really masterfully using words that create richness by layered meanings, by not just the surface meaning, which makes sense in the context of what's being said in the poem, but also alternative meanings that can be uh, not sort of like um, detours, but rather layers of value. For example, you take the word contracted in, it's roughly line 10, right, line 11. If you're looking at your lecture notes, and you should look at the notes as you're uh, listening along here, okay? It says, I have heard in the voices of the wind, the voices of my dim killed children, I have contracted. Single three-word sentence by itself. I have contracted. Um, contracted can mean contracted as in a disease. All right? It could mean contracted as in I have pulled back and restricted myself. All right? And both of those meanings sort of fit in the context of the value of this poem as we have a person here who has had abortion, who ha has mixed feelings about what has happened and how she's felt during this process. You add this to the word dim from the preceding couple of lines, the voices of my dim killed children. All right, this could suggest first of all that they were dim themselves as in not too bright. Maybe there was something wrong with these babies before they were born. Uh, she doesn't use the word babies in the poem, which is kind of interesting. Um, she also doesn't use the word live in the poem or alive in the poem, which is also kind of interesting. So it's not just the words you use, it's the words you might leave out that also lend opportunity for meaning here. But dim could also mean as in back alley abortions um, or something done out of the light, something done that was not quite right. Not dark, but dim as in maybe... 
it's not quite clear what the right thing is to do. So in choosing your words very carefully, what you do is you create opportunities for meaning. Um, what you don't want to do, though, and she doesn't do here, is use vague words that allow people essentially a sort of um, fill-in-the-blank poem where they can take whatever they want it to mean and impose that value upon it. So when you have vague words, verbs like do or have that don't describe any activity in particular, uh, the worst of all nouns like it or thing, right? Um, that don't attach themselves to any particular objects or individuals, um, all you have is a blank space that forces your reader to do the work for you. That's not what you want to happen. What you want to do is provide very precise meanings with your words that give your readers definite directions to go in, and not even necessarily to choose from, but to layer upon one another to make sense of the poem and how it works. We have different values for words. There are some that are strong, there are some that are weak, and we have different parts of speech that serve different purposes. Strong words are words that we call heavy. They carry lots of value, lots of meaning. They're very precise in those values. Uh, they don't necessarily sound heavy, but they're definite. Uh, words like blood, grave, dirt, are heavy words. Then we have weak words. Weak words don't necessarily have so much value or so much clarity or so much precision. Um, they take up space, as I was just talking about, but they don't necessarily lead an audience in, in any concrete way. Um, like I said, a poem shouldn't mean whatever a reader wants it to. The words have definite limitations in terms of their meanings and values, and we want to work with on the, in those limitations and make good choices so that we are ultimately controlling the meaning of the poem for the reader. All right, Words like went or do or have or some. Even, even a word like boat, which is a very vague term for any surface floating vessel, Right? There are, there are dozens of different variations of boats. Pet, not cat or dog, not a specific breed, just pet. Could be a canary, could be a snake, could be a reptile, I don't know. Doesn't give us very much. These are light words rather than heavy words. Then we have parts of speech, and really the bones of a poem are in the nouns and the verbs. These are the most powerful and important parts of speech. When we have adjectives and adverbs, they're essentially there to modify the nouns and the verbs. They are like support staff, okay? They're not the athlete. They're the athlete's trainer, which I'm not saying they're not necessarily important, but they're not the ones performing. Um, so with adjectives and adverbs, we have to be very careful that what we don't do is be careless with our nouns and verbs. You use a weak noun, it needs an adjective to make it more clear. You use a strong noun, you don't necessarily need the adjective. Now back to the best words in the best order. If you are using strong words, you don't need as many. And efficiency is important too. You don't want in a poem to have to use twice as many words as it takes to say something beautifully just because you're not using the right words in the first place. Use stronger nouns and verbs. Use fewer adjectives and adverbs. Not that you can't use these to great effect. Sometimes you can. You can stack them up and they, they present a different flavor in the poem. But for the most part, we want to try to avoid them as often as not. All right? Clichés, I probably don't need to talk about them. You all know what they are. Those are those things that have already been said too many times. And along with them, common phrases, okay? Uh, I've seen in some of your poems that, that you tend to, and, and this makes sense, don't get me wrong, it's not unusual at all. You tend to go back to those phrases that you've heard before, that are typical before, that you've used before. Most especially when we're talking about um, noun and adjective pairings, right? The deep blue sea, what else do we have here that I've seen? Um, the bright sun, the warm smile, uh, the, cool, the cool breeze, right? These are so typical as pairings that they've almost lost their value altogether. 
So what we want to do is we want to take the common phrasings and move them towards uncommon phrasings, okay? Not tears rolling down my cheeks, but his face scored by stream, scored by crying streams. Not a warm smile, but maybe a clumpy eyelash smile. Now that may or may not make any sense to you, but I'm sure it creates an image for you that might be more valuable, all right? Not necessarily even that they make straightforward sense, kind of like an artist painter's job is not necessarily to capture reality as perfectly as possible, but simply to make some new kind of sense out of reality. So instead of a bright sun, maybe we have a liquid sun. And that might not at first make any sense, but it certainly is fresher than saying the bright sun. Have you ever seen the sun not be bright? Think about it for a minute. Do you really need that word? All right. Now, in addition, there's a different way you can use words, and that's what, what I call word shadows or word shadowing, okay? When you create a group of words that all kind of fit into a similar topic or theme, all right? And what they do is they sort of prepare your reader for some additional value or meaning that may or may not be directly revealed in the poem. I've provided you with this little poem called Becoming Vegetarian uh, as an example of it where you're taking words that work again on multiple levels within the context of the poem and the story that's being told in the poem but also that put together makes some other kind of sense that's useful or valuable in the poem. So the poem is titled Becoming Vegetarian. This gives us a clue, right? It has something to do with what we eat. When Tuvi's head was blown off from the probably accidental purging of his friend's father's shotgun while they played, unwatched and marinating, no beef between them. Twinklings of skull chips and goo in a stew basted the wall behind him as ten-year-old Mary walked in. She didn't flinch, no longer tender to the streets. She chewed her gristly lip, walked out, and never ate meat again. And so here with this poem, if you look a little bit more carefully, what you see are words related to eating, related to meat, okay? Purging, uh, beef, uh, stew, tender, chewed, gristle, gristly, right? Um, and that all leads up in a way, without the reader necessarily uh, noticing it, obviously, although this example, it's fairly obvious intentionally, to the last line, never ate meat again. Right. This was the effect that it had, the way in which the speaker um, or the, the subject, I should say, uh, was able to control that uncontrollable thing that they had experienced. So here we have these words that serve multiple meanings, multiple values, but also make sense within the sentences in which they're fit. Now, in addition to these ideas, right, we also have issues of diction and syntax, okay? Diction being the choice of words, syntax being the order of words, and you can play with the order of words and create different meanings for the words that you would normally put in a, in a fairly standard or common order. But we want to talk about these two things as the dictators of tone, that when you create a certain emotional value for your poem. Essentially, you do it by selecting certain kinds of words as opposed to other kinds of words. Um, in, in speech, when we're talking with someone, we've got all sorts of things we can do. We've got our hands, we've got our faces, we've got our body language, we've got the, the volume, right, of our voices, we've got the color of our voices. Um, we can change those things and adjust those things to create more or different values or meanings. Oftentimes we say certain things and mean exactly the opposite and people know that by the look on our face or by the inflection in our voice. You've all had problems I'm sure with the fact that when you say something in a text message all the rest of that value that you might attach to it isn't there and people oftentimes misunderstand another one another. It's even worse um, when we're talking about a written word and a poem, okay? Because at least when you're texting people, they generally have some experience with you on a personal level. So they can assume things based on the history of your relationship. As a poet, there isn't necessarily any relationship at all between the author and the reader. So uh, 
uh, all they have is the words and you have to be careful now mostly when we talk about tones we're talking about patterns okay variations and concentrations um, you can do this oftentimes with types of words you can do it with different sounds if you want to and I'm really going to try to stay away from sound because um, that's going to be the lesson for next week the way that the w the way that certain words uh, are heard or are created in the mouth have a deep impact on the emotional value that they carry um, but ultimately, there are variations or different levels or layers of diction that we might identify, right? Plain, dif plain diction comes from plain language. Uh, no one better than Robert Frost, Emily Dickinson at plain language. Um, if you look at stopping by woods on a snowy eve, what you have is a simple pastoral subject expressed in simple, common, casual, common ways. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. Okay? There's nothing more than a two-syllable word there. There's a gracefulness and a beauty about the words that are chosen. And the simplicity has value in itself, all right? So it's not necessarily that you have to choose the fanciest words in order for them to be the best. It's always a relationship between... The value of the poem, the message, the emotional meaning of the poem, the meaning of the poem, the purpose of the author, all of those really kind of are the same thing, and the words you choose to represent them, all right? Um, sometimes very complicated words are very useful if you've got a complicated subject. Other times that's not at all the case. E.E. Uh, e. Cummings' poem. Me Up at Does, which I've shown you before, is a great example of that. Me Up at Does, out of the floor, quietly stare a poisoned mouse, still, who alive is asking, what have I done that you wouldn't have? Simple subject, simple words, out of order, which in this particular case makes an awful lot of sense, given that the subject, the speaker, was probably tremendously startled by the fact that uh, they were being confronted by a mouse that they had just poisoned who was destined to die. Uh, that might upset you a little bit, I don't know, but it might put you off your game if you weren't expecting to see it looking back at you. Um, that's an explanation for the confusion of order here that makes some sense in that context. Anyway, um, poetic diction really is almost like a bad thing nowadays, but it would be when a poet is using words that are fancy, all right? Take a look at the examples, uh, words on page 119 in your reading. Opalescent, beauteous, arabesque, fraught, not necessarily the wrong words in meaning or even the wrong words in sound, but very kind of elevated diction, um, higher than formal, almost intentionally fancy, the kind of way that you would have written 100, 150, 200 years ago um, in 21st or 22nd century America or whatever century this is, we don't speak that way anymore. And so uh, poetic, being poetic or being highly formal is less appropriate nowadays in our current world because it's not the way people sound. Ode to the West Wind was a famous poem by Percy Shelley written a couple of hundred years ago. In its time, it was perfect. O oh, wild west wind, thou breath of autumn's being, thou from whose unseen present the leaves dead are driven like ghosts from an enchanter fleeing, etc., etc., etc. Two hundred years ago, people sounded like that, and poems sounded like that. Nowadays, not quite so much. All right, we tend to speak more plainly, more directly, even more casually, especially in America. Um, if you go to Europe, you'll find that diction is more proper for the most part. Uh, cerebral diction, brainy words, okay, sounding smart, okay, even worse than sounding smart, um, making thinking poems, and thinking poems are not necessarily bad, but there's 
there's a, an impediment that a thinking poem creates. And if you believe that your poems are intended to make people feel rather than to make people think, um, sometimes the brain gets in the way of the emotional value and it's difficult to distill. If you've ever read something that some people think is beautiful and you had to look up every other word in order to know what it meant and then barely be able to hold on to it, then you know how a poem can fail if it's using too many thinking words like infrastructure or metadiscursive. Here's an example from Connie Markham Wong called The Gift of Poetry, which is actually a, it's a brilliant poem overall, but if you don't quite have the vocabulary, if you're not quite tuned into this level of language, it may be very difficult for it to have any emotional value for you. A poet enters a private sanctuary, a sacred place where the imagination dwells with a melange of emotions conceived by aesthetic beauty, often divine and esoteric in nature, that comprehensive longing to express through common language that which is so vitally uncommon, etc. Okay, it's a longer poem. Give it a read if you want to. It's easy to find. But what it shows you is that um, and it does so ironically, which is part of what makes it so brilliant, as it says, comprehensive longing to express through common language that which is so vitally uncommon. In saying so, using uncommon language is kind of odd. Um, I'm sure that some of you, at the very least, that didn't put a dent in you. Um, and that's no fault of yours, okay? This is more like what you might call a poet's poem, right? Kind of like, I don't know, um, certain musicians, studio musicians, 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 who are so good that most people can't even understand why they're good. This is the problem you run into when you start getting too careful and too uh, logical or thoughtful uh, or intellectual with your language. Sometimes it just needs to flow. For contrast, okay, you can look at the tone which is more slang or street or casual. Beautiful poem by Gwendolyn Brooks. We real cool, the pool players, seven at the golden shovel. We real cool, we left school. We lurk late, we strike straight. We sing sin, we thin gin. We jazz June, we die soon. Okay, really, really different. Not better or worse, just different because of the word choice, okay? Because of the phrasing differences. It's not speaking proper English, which is, in this case, perfectly appropriate, all right? Formal diction very close to, um, very close to what we were talking about with the intellectual poem or the cerebral style, okay, using elevated language, using perfectly proper grammatical structures. It has its value. It has its effect, all right? Again, the ultimate lesson in terms of your diction choice is whether or not the impression that the words you choose make suit the purpose and the value of the poem, especially on an emotional level. All right. If you're talking about a difficult intellectual subject or a scientific element in a poem, then maybe it should sound scientific. But if you're talking about, I don't know, something of nature, maybe the language should sound more natural. Anyway, on top of these, these choices, right, some ways in which you can kind of control your choices is by thinking about things like the history of the words, what we call etymology, that if you look in... Uh, a good lexicon dictionary, oftentimes what you'll see is that your words have got not just their standard Merriam-Webster meanings, but um, have the entire history of the word, including the language of origin, which is usually for English either French, Latin, or, um, or Old English, all right, that these are the roots ultimately. And these different languages have very different kind of tones and um, carry different emotional values of themselves. French language, and I mean, I'm talking about tendencies here, but French language tends to carry the tone of the high court, of chivalry, of romance, okay? Words like chivalry itself, uh, sanguine, nonchalant, 
all right, are all French words. They're very, very graceful, very, very flowing, often the, the, the language of love, if you want to talk about it that way. Latin words tend to sound more intellectual, all right? So if you're writing a poem that's maybe more thought-based or, or maybe focused on more of an intellectual subject, like, I don't know, being a student, Right? Maybe you focus on more intellectual Latin root language, okay? Tends to transmit a level of uh, arrogance or a level of intellectuality um, that can be very useful. Words like cerebellum, most of the body parts, pandemonium, librarian, all, all Latin based words. Then the Old English words, and they tend to be very different from the other two because they tend to be much more. Uh, simple, straightforward, much heavier and harsher in their sounding, not necessarily in their meaning, okay? Um, they're the language of the earth, primarily because the Old English were people of the earth, farmers and whatnot. So the Old English words would be words that are more like this, dwell, stone, dark, gut, all right? And the word gut is... One of my favorites on my list from earlier because it almost, when you say it, activates your lower abdomen. It's a low, deep, heavy word. Part of that has to do with what we call phonology, which we're going to get into next week. The way in which sounds are created by the body and the physiological slash emotional connection to words that we have. Okay, um, so I'm not going to dig into that, but generally speaking, these words are more the words of nature, uh, the words of simplicity. The Old English were, again, farmers, hard workers, fishermen. They were not those who studied. They were not those who knew how to read. Okay, they were not um, the high court like the French. Okay, and so what they had was simple language for simple purposes, but hard, heavy purposes. So hopefully this has brought a little light onto um, your thinking about the way you use your words and that hopefully you'll be a little bit more careful with the way you choose your words to try to connect those words more so with the value or the emotional meaning or the intellectual meaning of the poems that you're trying to write.